In our last video on amino acids, we're going to talk about peptide bonds, how to link amino acids together. So the first thing I want to talk about peptide bonds is there are occasionally questions in the MCAT where they tell you the molecular weight of a protein. The protein might have a large molecular weight like 6,000 Daltons. And they'll ask you, how many amino acids is this protein made of? And the way to answer this question is you need to have memorized for the MCAT the average molecular weight of amino acids, which is 110 Daltons, right? We've seen all the amino acids, their side chains are all different shapes and sizes, and each amino acid has a different molecular weight. But the average weight is 110 Daltons. So whatever weight your protein is, you divide that by 110, and that gives you an estimate of the number of amino acids that protein is made of. Okay, so in terms of forming a peptide bond, you should know that it is an endergonic reaction. So that means it is energetically unfavorable, and by itself is not going to happen. So that's why in cells, ATP is required, right? ATP through reaction coupling can make the net process exergonic and favorable. However, at the same time, enzymes are also required, meaning that this process has a high activation energy and normally proceeds very, very slowly. So again, in cells, we need both enzymes and ATP to allow this process to occur. Finally, another important point about peptide bond formation is to know that it's a type of condensation reaction, meaning that water is going to be formed as a product. So let's take a look. Here I've got two different amino acids. I haven't specified what amino acids they are, just that one has a side chain of R1, the other one has a side chain of R2. So I want to form a peptide bond between these two amino acids. And essentially, the way it works is this amino group is going to act as a nucleophile and it's going to attack the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. And through this process, we're going to form our dipeptide. H3M plus R1 carbonyl, the other amino group, our other side chain, and the carboxylate. All right. So when we look at this molecule, now we can identify our peptide bond. Our peptide bond is this bond that was formed right here. So I'm gonna label this as the peptide bond. Okay, now there's a few things you should notice about how this bond was formed. When this bond was formed, you can see that the amino acid on the left, R1 side chain, it has the free amino group. The amino acid on the right, it has a free carboxylic acid group. So what's important about this is that when it comes to amino acid, the order of the amino acids is important. So what I mean by this is, if they are talking about a dipeptide on the MCAT, you should know that if I have a peptide like alanine tyrosine, this is not the same as tyrosine alanine, All right? These two dipeptides, they're made of the same exact amino acids, but they are different dipeptides because in one, the N-terminus, the free amino group is on alanine, and in the other, it's on tyrosine, and the carboxylic acid groups are also flipped. So that's important to keep in mind. The order does matter when forming peptide bonds. You're just not, you're not just like throwing things in a box, right? The order here matters. The second piece of information that's important to recognize about peptide bonds is there is resonance. This nitrogen, as part of the peptide bond, has a lone pair of electrons. And it's possible to push these electrons to this bond and push these electrons up onto that oxygen. In this case, since this is resonance, I'm going to go ahead and use our resonance arrows, and this is going to be the structure that we're left with. Again, most of the molecule is unchanged because they're not involved with the resonance. Now 
this is the molecule that we have, right? This is the resonance structure. And again, just to point out, this is the peptide bond right here. And what's important to know is that the peptide bond is not just a single bond, right? By resonance, it is essentially halfway between a single bond and a double bond. It's like a 1.5 bond, all right? And this is important to know because from this resonance, we say that the peptide bond has partial double bond character, right? Peptide bond has partial double bond character. Now, having partial double bond character has several implications. First of all, it's much stronger than a regular single bond. Second of all, this bond is less flexible than a single bond, right? With a single bond, you have free rotation, not with a double bond. But the more important point here is that the peptide bond is unusually strong, again, because of its partial double bond character. And if you think about it, the formation of a peptide bond is endergonic. That means hydrolysis of the peptide bond, breaking this peptide bond, is exergonic. However, even though this process is exergonic because this bond is very stable, it requires a very high amount of energy to break. So this has a high activation energy, so enzymes are still required for this process to occur. So we say that the peptide bond is unusually strong and enzymes are required to break it or break them even though the process is extragonic. All right. And the last thing I just want to make note of is if we look at the formation of this peptide bond, you have NH, which was originally N with three hydrogens, and you have O, which one of the oxygens is gone, all right? We lost an oxygen, we lost two hydrogens, and that's because, as I said, this is a condensation reaction. So I didn't draw this in, but another product is water. Okay, so that's peptide bonds as well as all of our videos covering amino acids.